We're going to start uh, 1997. I was 26 years old. I had more hair. I had just arrived in this town called Newport, Kentucky, about 18,000 people, directly across the river from Cincinnati, which is about 318,000 people. Um, like any other 26-year-old, I was probably a little naive. I was um, idealistic. I had some crazy ideas. I still have crazy ideas, but this, this one was profoundly crazy. Um, I worked for the city of Newport at the time. I took this crazy idea with no idea how I was going to fund it, no idea how I was actually going to even do it, took it into my boss's office. I said, Jim, you know that big rusty bridge? How about we turn it into the longest pedestrian bridge? Well, okay, the longest pedestrian bridge that links two states and probably the longest pedestrian bridge that links two states over the Ohio River, but the, a really, really long pedestrian bridge. Now, I, I'm looking back, and I think what he said was purely an act of avoidance to get me out of his office, but he said, sure, you, you go, go try that. 26-year-old, I heard permission. That was like, yes, go do that. So I did, game on. And then a few years later, this comes online, the Purple People Bridge, you know, cleverly named for its purple paint job. But it's, it was this profound change in the way that people experienced our city. It, it moves people back and forth across this river, H half a million people a year easily go across this bridge. It changed the way people use our riverfronts. More importantly, it changed the way that I perceived my home. Because as a 26-year-old and a few years after that, I'm all of a sudden empowered to do crazy things like this. Like, why would anyone trust anyone to do that? I, I was given this opportunity in this place. I'm like, wait a minute, if, I'm, if they're trusting me to do this kind of work, I don't, I, I, I gotta stay here. This is crazy, this is, this is a great place to call home. So I've called Cincinnati home for the last 20 years and, and doing really, really interesting things. But it's also, and it's been really fun, I guess, to say that in those 20 years, I've been able to look back on a lot of the crazy ideas that we've been able to accomplish. And it, it comes back to not being able to do a lot of these things alone, and that if I've been trying to get other people to do crazy things, I've had to help them along with, with a few things, right? And those things kind of fall into these categories. Now, I got for permission to do a bridge. Well, and um, it sometimes turns into being sanctioned to do something, or you get validation of your idea. It could also be that you just are freed, you have the permission to be freed from some of the obligations you have in your daily life so that you have the time to go work on these things. But to help people with that permission and that sanction has been something that um, has been useful. For the last 20 years also, I've been surrounded, or have surrounded myself, with a, a really great team of co-conspirators. That this, this group of people that all have networks, they all have some kind of superpower, but they're all similarly motivated to make some kind of fundamental change in the city. And it's been fantastic. I know that I could never have been doing the things I've been doing if I weren't surrounded by really great people. So to be able to help others put together their team of co-conspirators has been a joy for the last 20 years as well. And then of course, some funding. We've heard lots of times. I mean, things cost money to do, right? You just, you need some funds to do these projects. So if, if we were to look at money for a second, right? Like, where does one get funding for crazy projects? Crazy civic projects, crazy community projects? Well, I mean, looking back, I mean, you could usually go to some level of government for some of this. You could go to city governments or county governments or state governments, federal governments. I think the time of that is maybe past, I don't know, at least where we're from. There isn't as much largesse in the public sector funding anymore. And I'm not necessarily starting a bunch of businesses, so I think the investor class is probably less interested in funding some of these crazy ideas. Some of them barely cash flow. I can't imagine they're making any rate of return. So I think that these crazy ideas, these, these community ideas, start to fall on philanthropy to help make them happen. Now, philanthropy, when I, when I close my eyes and I think of philanthropy, I mean, I start thinking of, of guys that, of, of things that look like, sorry, um, doesn't work anymore. Um, I, think, I think of foundations, right? And foundations, there, 
thinking that looked like this, right? I mean, there are people who, through industry or through business, they made a pile of money, and they, they've created these similarly large foundations that, that are, have a national or an international viewpoint and are trying to change the world, or they're going to build libraries all over the country, or, or they're going to cure the world of malaria, or they're, they're going to wage a war on poverty. Um, and they're doing good work. I, I don't get that wrong. But I think foundations, whether they're big ones or they're really small ones, they all work the same way, right? So foundations give money to organizations, and those organizations do something to improve the lives of people, of individuals. Um, it doesn't help me much as this 26-year-old with a bridge idea, because foundations don't give to people. They give to organizations, and those organizations do something to help people. So, um, start thinking about this a little bit more. And that unless you've been living under a rock, that you've seen other models emerge of what philanthropy is. Philanthropy isn't always foundations. You know, companies have been taking this corporate social responsibility role to different places. I mean, these guys, they sold, you know, they gave away a million shoes in four years. You know, this, this idea of buy one, give one, it's an, an interesting concept. Or crowdfunding, right? I mean, like, how crazy is this? Who would have predicted the scale of a, a Kickstarter and Indiegogo and, and Donors Choose and Power to Give and all these different platforms? Everywhere you look, there's another platform. I mean, Kickstarter alone, right? 10 million users, $2 billion committed towards community projects, 100,000 successful projects. This is, and it's game changing, right? But this is really, really um, a fascinating model. And then I don't know if anybody do this. Anybody? Okay. One of my dear friends died of ALS, and, and so I thank you personally for that. But this, there is two and a half million videos on the internet right now of people dumping ice on their head in the name of ALS. I mean, I bet you most of those people didn't even know what ALS was, and now a bunch of them making contributions. But this has changed the, changed the way that philanthropy is perceived. I think pr philanthropy now, bigger than foundations, found philanthropy, all of these that I was just showing, are all harnessing these power of individuals, whether it's groups of people raising money or projects that are coming from individuals or both. These are all, invest these are all harnessing the power of individuals working together to solve things or to give opportunities, rather. Unfortunately, foundations are still stuck at this, where you have, again, a foundation giving to an organization which does something on people. Th there's something that probably needs to change. And we're thinking about this. So what, what would happen? Could, could foundations rethink the way they support individuals in communities? Like, what would happen if some of foundation money, not all foundation money, if one of some foundation money skipped the middleman, right, and went actually to support individuals directly? What would that do for a community like Cincinnati or like Guernsey or London, Ontario, where, where I'm from, where they're full of people that give a damn about their city, but just are having trouble finding the resources to get some of these projects done? So what would this look like? I mean, this is, this is crazy. Well, it is crazy, so, but it was crazy enough that I wanted to try it. So I wanted to figure out, could we change a foundation's model and see if it worked? The problem is I needed a foundation who'd be willing to, to work with us on this and see if we could divert some funds directly to individuals. Well, great news, Mark didn't mention it, I work for a foundation, right? Um, it's not, by the way, um, one of the foundations by these guys. Um, it's actually a foundation that was created and named for, um, for, these, well, for these people. Right, this is Carol and Ralph Hale. Uh, they built a bank in northern Kentucky. They sold the bank. They made a lot of money. They went to all the right parties, and they went to, you know, they belonged to all the right clubs. But by the end of the night, these guys would be having the fun in the kitchen with the staff. Right? These are people who were fascinated by other people. They were the people, they, they didn't follow convention usually. So it's only right that a foundation with this DNA is the foundation that wants to take on an experiment. In, in how foundations work and how foundations support a community. Now, to be clear, most of our grant making still follows this model, right? Um, we still, and we're doing fine doing that. 
But we started asking ourselves some questions a couple years ago, one of which was like, how do we become a little more proactive with our grant making? How can we start making a difference in more people's lives directly? And it got us to another question where we're seeing this, this natural, um, I don't know, natural wave of retirements in, in leadership of our social infrastructure, our civic organizations. We're seeing the same people running for office over and over again. It's like, how do we find the next group of people who are going to be the civic leadership in Cincinnati? What, how, where's that civic secession plan going to come from? So we started putting these together, like, well, wait a minute, what happens if we would use some of these funds to make grants to the people that we think are going to be the next leaders in our community? How can we train them, and how can we empower them, and how can we teach them how to be even more prominent in the community? So we did, and we created this thing called People's Liberty. Now, People's Liberty, to be honest, that was the name of Carol and Ralph's old bank. It sounded like the right kind of tone, it was power to the people. Um, it, was, it had this... Um, yeah, you know, sort of subtly disruptive kind of sound to it, but it was a nod back to their, their um, legacy. But People's Liberty is set up intentionally as a philanthropic lab where we're experimenting with new types of grant making. And it's, it's a, a short-term project, but like full press. We're going to try this and see if it works. And we went out first big, right? We went with our biggest idea where, and I know that Mark mentioned that in Guernsey, like Cincinnati, people like side projects, right? Everybody's doing something in their, si in their spare time. They're doing their, they, they have something, um, they're, they're, they're working in their evenings and the afternoons or their, their you know, weekends on some project because people care. They want to do something important. So what, what we did is like, what would happen if you were un, unhinged, I mean, that's the wrong word, if you were let loose from your restrictions of your day job for an entire year? what would you do? So we launched this Hale Fellowship as a civic sabbatical. Take a year. We're asking our community, what would you do if you were released from your job for a year? You could take a year off, push pause on all of that, and work on something big for the community. You have the gift of time and $100,000. What would you do with your community? This isn't the abstract, right? So we've, we've already funded a few of these. So these two, both named Brad, oddly enough, the guy behind the sign, he was really, he was an architect at a big architecture firm in Cincinnati, was fascinated, was, I don't know, fascinated, worried about affordable housing in Cincinnati. He's also watching this huge um, outgrowth of all this interest in tiny living. So he's actually saying, he put those two together, he said, wait, can, I, can tiny houses be a solution for affordable housing in a built-out environment like Cincinnati? So he's going to try it. He's, build, he's designing and building and selling two houses, two tiny houses. The other bread behind, in front of the screen was a musician who made more in one commercial gig, writing a song for a commercial, than he had in a month of gigs with his band. Right? And he's like, this is wrong. I've got to figure out a way that musicians can live a life as musicians. And if I could just make musicians, music, uh, find musicians who would be willing to license their music quicker and match them up with music, commercial music buyers, could we create a marketplace so that local music buyers could be supporting the local music scene and musicians can be living a life? Both things from their passion, both things they would experience in, and they're spending a year building out these ideas and, and where they go from there, it's gonna be interesting to see. We aren't just doing $100,000 grants. We're trying different types of things, but all these grants directly to individuals. We have a storefront in our building that's a gallery space that we give grants to people for three months. They own our storefront. They can turn it into something, they can transform it into something that engages people, that gets people to act or to react or to join. So there's Jason, um, it, with his theme of kindness, he, he bought 30, with his grant, he bought 30 old vending machines, filled them all with thousands of plastic eggs, each one of them with a little good deed inside, and sent them out all over the place. These, the, the program called Good Eggs now is like people all over town doing good deeds for each other with these little plastic eggs. The one in the middle, Jacqueline, she built a mini micro cinema to expand our horizons of video and film in Cincinnati, which was lacking. And then Amy, built, uh, an architect, built this immersive, meditative environment to get just people to calm down during the holiday season. And they, they took over our storefronts for each for three months. We're doing even smaller grants where we're funding side projects of people, trying to get them that little gateway drug into more civic doing. 
So it could be giant bean bags or a public, uh, a public history walk or a black dance theater or black dance festival or a bigger than life uh, human powered space invaders game that's projected up on the side of vacant buildings to, uh, to spotlight that. All kinds of things that people, we didn't know what to expect to see, but these people are coming in with ideas and they're now, we're building this community of people who are addicted to doing who are now have experience in creating something, and people are taking notice. This community is growing, and now other communities, um, the media, more importantly, other foundations are starting to take notice of this. They're seeing this as a, as a legitimate model to change communities, which is really gratifying for me for taking this crazy risk. So I think what, we, what we're learning is that if foundations in particular, so I'm speaking as with my foundation hat, if foundations want to be relevant in this, this time, this changing time of philanthropy, and if they really want to make a difference in communities, they have to be open to different models. I think the civic sabbatical or these micro grants to individuals, something that empowers people to get people to join and gets people to act, gives them experience, raises their profile, surrounds them with, with other good people, gives them that permission to do something, gives them a little bit of funding, I think it's a way that's going to make a difference. Uh, philanthropy is a lot more than just cutting checks, and it's a lot more than just cutting checks to nonprofits. So I think what we're trying to say is that if you're going to invest in place, you have to invest in people. I mean, people make communities, but really engaged and empowered people, they make great communities. Thank you. <laughs>